Hey everybody, I am chasing the light right now, so I hope I am able to finish this video before the sun goes down. Um, but today we're going to talk about what sebum is made from. So for those of you who don't know, sebum is the natural oily secretions from your sebaceous glands. So those are the oil ducts in your skin and your scalp, helps to moisturize and protect your skin and your scalp. <laughs> and also um, the sebaceous glands in your scalp tend to produce quite a bit of sebum uh, because it leaks onto your hair and coats your hair and also protects your hair. Now I just washed my hair so there's not much sebum in there which is probably why it's fluffy and a little bit frizzy right now. Um, it's actually still a little bit wet here in the back because I like to let it air dry. Uh, but uh, yeah, if my hair looks awful today, that's why. Just as a disclaimer, I'm not a trichologist. I'm not even a cosmetologist. I have a degree in biochemistry, which means I study the behavior of chemicals, both organic and inorganic, but specifically what they tend to do inside of the body. I also have super long hair. Uh, you might not be able to tell because this is my bangs growing up in 2016, but the longest part of my hair last time I measured was 58 inches which means it grazes the backs of my calves now. So I like to mix several of my interests and get nerdy about hair and making videos like this uh, about what I learn and what I research is how I best retain the information on uh, keeping my own hair healthy. And hopefully to some of you, it's also entertaining and informative. So for the general breakdown of sebum, we're going to turn to a 2009 article on sebaceous gland lipids by Picardo. They determined the chemical breakdown of sebum in humans is about 30 to 50% glycerides, 15 to 30% free fatty acids, 26 to 30% wax esters, 12 to 20% squalene, three to 6% cholesterol esters, and between one and a half and two and a half percent cholesterol. So we're already familiar with different types of glycerides, if you really think about it. If you think of the word triglyceride, that is the way that fats are packaged in our body. So you have the glycerol backbone on one side, which is quite polar in nature, and it's quite happy in water, but then is attached to three fatty acid chains, which makes it oil loving. Another type of glyceride is a phospholipid. So for those of you who have taken high school biology, if you uh, remember the membrane of a cell is made from a phospholipid bilayer. It's actually two layers of those phospholipids. Every single one of those phospholipids is a type of glyceride. The head of the phospholipid is very polar and water loving while the tail is very uh, non-polar and fat loving. But there are tons of different types of glycerides. Some are more polar and they act more water loving, some are more nonpolar and they act more oil loving, and some are very equally attracted to both, but that's why they're so useful because they can grab onto both oil and water. When a substance is able to grab onto both oil and water, we say that it can act like an emulsifier. So if you pour oil in water, you know that it doesn't like to mix. They'll pull up and they'll separate. But an emulsifier has one hand that can grab onto oil and another hand that can grab onto water so they can hang out. And so basically, if you shake oil and water with an emulsifier, it will create an, an emulsion, which is basically a mixture where it won't easily separate. And that's why you have products like lotions and creams and conditioners and uh, different cosmetics that contain both oil and water in their ingredients, but they don't really separate and they don't need to be constantly shaken. Another thing that an emulsifier can do, if it's polar enough, is it can act as a bit of a humectant. So a humectant is something that really likes water. It likes to make itself humid. That's where the term comes from. So say there's humidity in the air, you live in a tropical environment, or actually um, more accurately, and this might sound a little bit gross to some of you, but this is a reality. Um, you sweat quite a lot on your scalp. It's pretty warm with all that hair insulating it. And so you have humidity in your hair from your own sweat. So the hydrophilic molecules coating your hair can grab onto some of that water from your sweat and use it to draw moisture back into your scalp and hair. So now let's move on to the next component, which is the free fatty acids. So if you heard of a omega-3 fatty acid, this is a type of free fatty acid. You also have omega-6 and omega-9. You don't really need to worry about what those things mean. Just know that it's a free fatty acid. So you've heard of it before. Olive oil is full of MUFAs, which means uh, monounsaturated fatty acids. So you get the idea. So the difference between your fatty acid and your free fatty acid is obviously one is free. So when you think about your triglycerides, like I said before, you have your glycerol on one side and then your fatty acids, three of them attached. 
when they are not attached to the glycerol, they're free floating. And that's why it's called free. <laughs> so free fatty acids have a usually kind of small polar water loving acid head. And then it has a really, really long non-polar oil loving tail. How long that tail is really varies. And there are hundreds, thousands of uh, different lengths and types of free fatty acids out there. So let's go back to our oil and water analogy. So if you pour them both into a bowl or even oil and vinegar to make a salad dressing, you will often see that the oil will form a coating or a film over top of the vinegar or the water. So oils by themselves can be very good if used the right way and for the right hair type because it will form a seal or a film. This is the reason why you usually use conditioner on wet hair and uh, why you might dampen your hair before a hot oil treatment because the oil is capable of sealing in the moisture. It forms a coating, a light film or barrier around uh, the moisture in your hair. The best moisturizer is water itself. So if your hair is wet and you put the oil over it, it will prevent that moisture from evaporating. However, if your hair is very dry to begin with, then an oil coating by itself, just on your dry hair, might not be the best idea for you. In the same way that oil can form a barrier to prevent moisture from releasing from your hair, it can also provide a barrier that can prevent water from going in. So if you have a heavy oil on dry hair, it can prevent your hair from being properly hydrated in the first place. And this is why molecules with both hydrophilic and hydrophobic groups can be so great because they hold onto water for hydration and then they also hold onto the oil to help keep in the water. Oils can also act like a kind of lubricant, making the hair slippery. So this not only prevents dirt from sticking to or getting embedded into your scalp and hair, but it can also somewhat prevent tangles. Of course, we now have a lot of leave-in products that act as much more efficient detanglers, especially uh, silicones, which uh, also coat the hair and prevent them from sticking together. So we will now probably think, compared to those cone products, that their hair might act a bit more sticky and more prone to tangles when it hasn't been washed in a while and when it gets a little bit more greasy. But if you were to, say, wash your hair with very simple cleansers like a Castile soap and no follow-up conditioner or leave-in product, you might have a different view because you will see that without any sort of oil or any sort of coating on your hair, it can be very prone to tangles. So now let's move on to wax esters. And I'm sure everybody's heard of what wax is. So wax esters are two fatty acids, again, oil loving, mashed together and joined in the middle by a water loving ester group. There's a bit more to it than that, but you don't need to know exactly how it's made, rather just how it behaves. I'm sure you're starting to notice by now that with a couple of exceptions, almost all of the molecules that you will find in human sebum are mostly oil loving, but still just a little bit water loving. And this is what makes it a better moisturizer than just oils alone. So wax, most people have seen wax, they know of wax. It's hydrophobic or water hating. And some people wax their shoes to make them more water resistant if they're walking in the rain. Insects that are not very hairy, like beetles, will produce a type of waxy substance as well, so that water droplets will roll off them and not stick to them. So that prevents them from being weighted down by water, and it also helps prevent them from drowning. Same thing with the leaves of plants. They produce a type of waxy substance, uh, especially the lotus leaf is probably the most popular example of this because the lotus literally grows in water. The wax helps to keep the leaves dry and to prevent rot. I remember when I was about seven years old, my parents were starting to stage our house for to, to prepare it to be sold. And one thing that they did was they waxed the floors. And uh, it was beautiful. If you look at freshly waxed floors, it, everything looks super glossy. And if you've ever walked on it with stocking feet, you can know that it can be extremely slippery too. And I, I'm pretty sure I hurt my tailbone um, by just falling over so many times. So if you take this analogy, in your hair, wax esters can smooth over over the cuticle and make it look smooth and shiny. Wax also acts as an occlusive. So an occlusive seals in the moisture in your hair and scalp and prevents the moisture from evaporating like we talked about before. Now, wax does have a tendency to be kind of viscous and want to stick to itself. That's what makes it such a great occlusive. And that's also what gives hair that kind of chunky texture when you use styling wax or pomade. So depending on how much wax ester you produce in your sebum, buildup can lead to that kind of heavy, sticky feeling in your hair. 
The goal is to distribute your sebum as well as possible from the root to the tips of your hair. Obviously, when you have 58 inch hair like mine, no amount of sebum production is gonna reach the very end. So that's why I need conditioner. But <laughs> in a perfect world, um, using you know something like a boar bristle brush or uh, something very similar to that to really well distribute your sebum and all your waxes and oils and everything uh, so that it doesn't all collect at the scalp and the roots. Um, that can not only regulate the production, that will help evenly coat your hair and uh, keep it moisturized and give it shine. Another thing that you can do to help prevent buildup over time of your sebum is to try and stretch your washes. In the very beginning, this will feel really gross. I mean, you will feel like your hair is quite greasy, but over time, it will kind of send a signal to your sebaceous glands to produce less sebum or to produce it more slowly. Because if you're washing your hair and your scalp every single day, and especially using harsh clarifying products, um, it can dry out your scalp and then your body is just like, oh, th this isn't good. We don't want our skin to uh, crack or break because that would make it more prone to infections and whatnot. So we gotta upregulate our oil production. So if you are kind of doing the reverse and you are going longer between your washes and using perhaps a less harsh clarifying shampoo, then your body will say, okay, we don't have to produce so much, let's downregulate it. And then you can go longer between your washes without having that greasy buildup feeling. Squalene is probably the most fun sounding component of sebum. Uh, it was originally discovered in sharks, which is where it got its name. So in Latin, the Latin word for, sh for shark is squalus, and in Italian, it's squalo. In humans, squalene is more of a building block than anything else. It's kind of a stepping stone or an unfinished product that was on its way to becoming a fully mature cholesterol, or uh, when you're growing past cholesterol, uh, to make some sort of hormone in your body. But on its own, squalene is quite hydrophobic and super oily, and it acts similarly to a free fatty acid like we discussed before. Lastly, let's talk about cholesterol and cholesterol esters. So we're on the home stretch now. Cholesterol has gotten such a bad rap in the medical world, but you would not be able to live without it. After phospholipids, cholesterol makes up a huge part of every cell in your body. Almost 30% of every membrane of your cells are made from cholesterol. Cholesterol helps your cells stay fluid and supple and flexible over a wider range of temperatures. It helps to determine what comes in and goes out of your cells uh, because it it makes for a um, selective permeable membrane, and it's a crucial building block for all of your sex hormones, all of your stress hormones. It creates vitamin D in your body uh, when it reacts to the sun. It's so important that every single cell in your body knows how to make cholesterol. So even if you got zero cholesterol in your diet, your body is still going to expend energy to make enough of it for your body. Cholesterol is a larger molecule and it might be thicker or more viscous, say, than some free fatty acids. It works great as a softener and for sealing in moisture as an occlusive, like we mentioned before. And in cosmetics, it can also act like an emulsifier, holding creams together so it doesn't separate. But cholesterol and cholesterol esters make up the smallest part of your sebum. So I remember when I was a kid, my mom would buy these big tubs of just the word like super cholesterol across it. And she would slather her hair and my hair with this stuff. It was like a conditioner on steroids because uh, you only needed a little bit of it and it took a, quite a while to rinse out. It felt like forever when I was six years old and it made my hair so slippery afterwards. So this concludes what your sebum is made from, the most natural hair and skin moisturizer in the world, and how each component works. And I guess as a bit of a bonus, you also learned what an occlusive and humectant and an emulsifier is. If you would like more clarification on those things, I can make a separate video talking about only those things. Uh, so if you see that term used in your ingredients uh, when you're looking at different hair products, you'll know what it means and what it's used for. Uh, so if you have any other questions, feel free to leave a comment down below. I love getting questions. And if you also have that gigantic tub of cholesterol in your bathroom that you slather on your hair, leave a comment down below. I'd love to know about that too. <laughs> so I hope you enjoyed this video. I, I plan to do more hair videos this coming year. I think it was been like a year since I did my last one, but I would like to get to the point where I'm doing hair videos uh, once every month or once every couple of months. So thank you so much for watching and I'll see you all next week for another video. Bye.